A recent seminary grad, when he was in seminary, worked with me for a while as my intern. And he came to me and he said, I heard the greatest joke at seminary the other day. It was based on the lesson we just read. Jesus says to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, well, you are the eschatological manifestation of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, huh? Now, the thing with that joke is, I laughed when I heard it then, but I heard it for the first time 38 years ago when I was in seminary. They've been telling that one a long time. Because that's how you talk about Jesus in seminary, isn't it? The eschatological manifestation of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Do not worry, I'm not going to unpack that one for you here this morning. But the question remains, who do people say that I am? Jesus apparently was not on Facebook to know what the world was saying about him or Instagram. All you have to do is check in with your friends, if they are your friends, and find out what people are saying about you. But this is Mark's gospel. You have to remember, Mark's gospel is very different. It's the earliest of the gospels, the shortest of the gospels, only 16 chapters, and Jesus is being driven the whole time toward the cross. It's all about the cross for Mark. Mark doesn't care about no stinking baby in a manger. He doesn't care about the shepherds and the wise men and the angels singing. This is the beginning of the good news of the gospel, of the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. It's his baptism, his baptism. Then he calls the disciples and he's on the road. And he's on the road and he turns to the disciples and he says, what are people saying about me? Have you ever had anybody say that to you? What's, what are they saying about me? What are they saying about me in the church? Or what are they saying about me at work? What are they saying about me behind my back? The disciples are taken a little bit aback by this. And they say, John the Baptist. That's what some are saying. Now you have to remember, John the Baptist in Mark's gospel at this point has just been arrested and put to death. And people are expecting maybe this is John returning for us. Then they say, some say Elijah. Now, if you think about Elijah for a moment, Elijah is the great prophet of Israel that people thought was going to return one day to be the predecessor of the Messiah coming. Because what, how does Elijah leave the scene? Swing low, sweet chariot. He is swept up into the sky. He doesn't die. He's just taken away. And the mantle's passed to Elisha, the other prophet. And remember Jesus at the transfiguration. Peter's present for that too. Elijah, representing the prophets, and Moses, representing the law, appear with Jesus as he is transfigured before them. And Peter, in typical Peter style, blunders through and says... Jesus, do you want us to build some tents? Do you want us to put up a tabernacle, a booth, something, so we can all spend the night here? Because he wanted to stay there. And God's voice had to come to Peter that said, Hush, this is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. Poor Peter. This is his finest moment, isn't it? This is Peter who will later deny even knowing Jesus. Three times he'll deny him. Jesus predicts that at his last meal with his disciples. He says, Oh, Peter, 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 Satan's going to sift you like wheat. You're going to be found wanting. And Peter says to him, as only Peter could, Lord, even if the others leave you, I will follow you, even if it means I die. And what happens before the sun comes up? I don't know him. Not him. Uh-uh. No, no. No idea who this man is. Three times he denies him. But Peter's going to get it right at this moment. Some people say Jesus is John the Baptist. Some say he's Elijah. Some say he's one of the prophets. But Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Messiah, capital M Messiah, big T Messiah, the Messiah. Now you have to understand, Messiah means anointed one. There have been others who were called Messiah. Cyrus of Persia, the one who got rid of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom and let the Jews return to their holy city and rebuild their temple. Cyrus of Persia called a Messiah, meaning an anointed one. But Peter's not saying he is a Messiah. He's saying you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus says, now that you know what that means, here's what happens next. He's going to be tortured. He's going to suffer. He's going to be killed. He's going to be buried. He's going to die. He's going to be raised on the third day. And Peter says to him, the equivalent in Greek from what I read, I don't read Greek or know biblical Greek, but the commentaries say it's the equivalent of saying, shut up, Lord, shut up. It's really the equivalent of a child going, la, 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 when they don't want to hear something, or a husband going, la, 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 when they don't want to hear something. It's that sort of, I can't listen to this, and he tries to tell him to be quiet. And so Peter, who finally gets it right, then hears those horrible words, get behind me, Satan. Pretty far to fall, isn't it? 
same Peter who, remember when Jesus walks to the disciples on the water during the storm to calm them down, and they say, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. No, and he says, it's me. And Peter's the one who says, if it is you, Lord, tell me and I'll walk to you. And he says, come to me. Peter gets out of the boat, starts to walk on the water, and then suddenly realizes, "Uh uh-oh, I'm not supposed to do this, and sinks. This is his sinking moment here as well because he got it right only to turn around and get it very, very wrong. This is a huge passage in Scripture, particularly in Mark's Gospel. This is a turning point because we have the word gospel in it again, the good news. Jesus says, those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. If you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. If you want to lose your life for his sake and the sake of the gospel, you'll be saved. Gospel. This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. That he is going to die for us and he's going to be raised for us and he's going to bring us with him. But that's not what they were thinking. He said, Peter, God, get your mind on the things of heaven, not the things of this world. The things of this world said that the Messiah who was going to come was going to be a mighty general, a military leader who was going to kick Rome's behind once and for all, get them out of the land, restore Israel to its prominence and its place in the land of promise. But that is not the kingdom that Jesus is talking about, is it? He's talking about a kingdom with different values, a kingdom that doesn't care about how big your army is, a kingdom that cares about how big your heart is. It's not a kingdom based on worldly power and financial gain. It's a kingdom based on the justice that God seeks for people, everyone having enough, everyone having the abundance that comes from people doing what is right out of their heart. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You're the Christ. Now, I'm going to ask you all to talk back this morning. You all ready to talk back, do some talking? Because churches that grow, and people ask me, what makes a church grow? A church grows from a lot of reasons, mostly because they understand who they are in light of God's grace and love in Jesus Christ, and mostly because they share what they believe. I'm going to ask you this morning, if Jesus were to be here this morning, and he is here this morning, but if he were to look at you and say to you, who do you say that I am, what would you answer? My friend, We sang, Jesus is all the world to me. He's my friend. We have a lot of friends, don't we? But we want to tell people who he is to us. Who else is he? He's your friend. I hope he's your friend. I hope you're his friend. What else would you say about Jesus? Who do you say that I am? My Savior. My Savior. What else do you say about Jesus? Who do you say that he is? Hmm? My King. And if he's your king, what does that mean? He rules in your heart. What else do you say? Think about scripture. What what does Jesus say? Let's take the opposite of Mark's gospel. Let's go to John. John, where Jesus is always saying, I am, I am, I am. What does Jesus say about himself? I am what? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the bread of life that has come down from heaven. Who else is Jesus? Teacher. Helper. Hmm? Healer. Healer. He's the future. He's the past. He's the present. He is the all in all. He is in us. He lives through us. He works in this church. He works through all his churches. But the problem is, we're not saying much about him, are we? We're not telling anybody, you know, what do you say about Jesus? I don't say a lot about Jesus. I come here, I sing about Jesus. I like that. I'll talk to my Sunday school class about Jesus, but we've got to be talking in the world about who he is in his fullness. He is the one who came for us. He is the one who gave his life for us. He is the one who is coming again to take us to himself. He is the one who's going to open the way to heaven for us. He is everything that we could ever hope to be. But then, as soon as you find out who he is, what does he say to you? If you want to find your life, you've got to give it up. You've got to give up those worldly ideas, and you've got to pick up your cross and follow me. We have no idea what that word meant. I wear a cross around my neck. Some of you have commented on my cross. It's not a crucifix. People think it's a crucifix. It's a 
cruciform, it's Jesus standing in front of a cross, but he has a shepherd's staff and he has sheep and lambs in his arms. It's Jesus, the good shepherd. It starts a lot of conversations because people in grocery stores, the checkers will say to me, or people in line will say, I love your cross. Where did you get it? What does it mean? But so many times we don't say much, do we? And we think about the word cross. The word cross was such a dirty word, such a word that was not used by decent people that it was never spoken about. And here is Jesus saying, now that you know who I am, let me tell you what that means. That means that I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die and I'm going to be raised again. But then he says, and if you want to follow me, you've got to pick up a cross. They would have been horrified. That would have been like swearing. That would have been like dropping an F-bomb in the day. You didn't say that because that was, that was the way of death reserved for the worst of the worst criminals. And this is the Messiah? This is the king, the one who is to come, the one who is to set everything straight? This is supposed to be our great warrior like David? And he's talking about a cross, picking up a cross and walking. Let me tell you one thing about a cross. You'll never have one put on your shoulders. Jesus doesn't operate like that. He will invite you to pick one up and follow him. And they're different for all of us, aren't they? They really are. I don't know what your cross is. I think we've all had a cross the last couple of years now called COVID-19. How we respond to it is the way we pick up our cross and follow. We either respond to it by coming together or we respond to it by letting it drive us farther and farther apart and fighting. I told you last week something that horrified me at a district meeting with my clergy colleagues when one of them said he had been physically threatened by a parishioner because he didn't want to wear a mask. In the church, that's what someone said to him. He said he was going to knock his block off. You don't say that in the body of Christ, do you, to each other or to anyone in the world? So there are two questions here today. You've got to be prepared to talk about them. Talk about them with your children and your grandchildren, but talk about them with other people. Don't go up and knock on a door and say, are you saved? Please don't ever say that to anybody. I always say to say, are you saved means I'm saved and you're not. Nain or nain or nain. Or that's what it sounds like to people who don't have a relationship with God. One of the churches I served had an evangelization program before I got there that I put an end to. They went up and knocked on doors and said to people, do you know what's going to happen to you when you die? And they'd slam the door in their faces and they couldn't understand why. But if you go to someone and say, I have a savior. I was a mess. I was healed. I was redeemed. I was loved to wholeness. I had grace shown to me you will find people who are ready to listen to that story. We're going to sing a song. It might be a new one for some of you. Trust me, it's not new. It's called The Hidden Source of Calm Repose. Anybody here know it? That was a big thud, wasn't it? Did you know it, Elaine, before we were singing it today? This The Hidden Source of Calm Repose, did you know it? Nope. Well, guess what? Y'all get to learn a new hymn from the 18th century. This is Charles Wesley's finest hymn in my book. This is going to be sung at my funeral, which I'm not hoping is anytime soon, but I've written it out. Jesus, my all in all thou art, my rest and toil, my ease and pain, the healing of my broken heart, in war my peace and loss my gain, my smile beneath the tyrant's frown, in shame my glory and my crown, in want my plentiful supply, in weakness my almighty power, in bonds my perfect Liberty, my light in Satan's darkest hour. In grief, my joy unspeakable. My life in death, my heaven in hell. Jesus Christ is those things for me, and Jesus Christ is those things for you. But what good does it do if we just tell each other? Because we know who he is. We've got to tell the world who he is. We have to show them by the way we live, by the way we forgive, by the way we act toward others, by what we sing and what we say and how we are. Because that shows who we are. I've told you this before. I do repeat myself. I'm old enough to do that and get away with it, I guess. But I taught the senior high Sunday school class in my last appointment. I'd been there for 11 years. So I had these little children from the time they were little piddly things to the time they were in high school. The Sunday that I came back after my husband's death, they looked like deer in headlights. They all sat there like this. Actually, the whole congregation sort of did that, but the kids were more open with me. I said, you have no idea what to say to me, do you? And they said, no, we don't. I said, if you know someone who has lost someone very close to them, what you say to them is, I'm sorry. Don't try to explain God away. Don't try to make it right. Don't try to fix it because you can't fix it. But say, I'm sorry. If you know the person well and you mean it, say, I love you. 
And if you really mean it, say, I'll pray for you. But don't say that like you're putting a Band-Aid on a sore boo-boo. Say that only if you mean it and you intend to do it. One of the kids said, Pastor Terry, my family prays for you every night. And I know he was telling me the truth. And they all said, we're sorry and we love you. And then one of them said, I did not expect you to be so joyful. I wasn't happy. I was so far from being happy. And people have said to me, you don't smile nearly as much as you used to. And I don't smile as much as I used to. I'll tell you that now. But there's a difference between happiness and joy. In grief, my joy unspeakable. Because I have a savior. I have a savior. And he gave his life for mine and for yours and for the rest of this world. He came that we might have life abundantly. Just like the kids with the little red mustaches. Sorry, moms, about that. Yeah, Ezra got a little bit of, he's got a little red, red mustache there. Joy that cannot take from you. Happiness depends on what's going on around you, but we have a Savior who is the source of our joy, the source of our life, our hope, and our life eternal. So now it's your turn. Who do you say that he is? What do you say, folks? What do you say about Jesus? Let's do that again. Yell it out. He's your friend. What else is he? Savior. Yell him out, folks. Say it like you mean it. Teacher. Joy. Hero. Good one. Companion. Here's your homework. Go home and say it to yourself until you're ready to say it to somebody else. Share what Christ has done for you. And then when he says, are you willing to pick up your cross and follow me? What do you say to that? I know many of you have already said it and you still mean it. Yes, Lord, I will follow you. I will follow you. I will follow you. To the end of this life and beyond the grave. Amen? Amen.